Um, I think we don't have a good answer to this. One can suggest various answers. One could suggest, for example, that one way to deal with, to, to, to discuss, to communicate with such people would be not to communicate with them directly, but to find a group of people who are only 95% fundamentalists, <laughs> who perhaps could be the gap, or people, and then maybe you can't reach those, so you find people who are only 82.5%. You try to find them the mediators, and the mediators between the mediators, and you have to act indirectly, and so on. If you cannot contact the 100% people who think that they have the whole truth directly, then how do you contact them? Uh, I think these are, I mean, these are huge questions, of course, but uh, and I think translation is simply one method that we have of trying, okay, I can, I can learn to, to speak their language. I can, uh, maybe I should learn their language or I should translate between them and us or me and them or whatever. Maybe that's one way, but is it better than some other way? Well, we don't know. Um, I think that's the, 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 the big question in human relations. But then, then we are in agreement on that. And it, that's we can't agree. That's even that's, 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 that's We have rationality. That I, 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 think I don't agree. Fundamentally, I, I think this is an ethical issue. Ah. For me, that's Very ethical. Good. So, in my next book that's on ethical. ethics, you will read a chapter that starts off with the idea that all of us have a non negotiable area. And I think the first step is to recognize that each of us, in order to enter into dialogue, restrains or, or partitions off an area that is non-negotiable, and we have to live with that in ourselves and in the other. But that's not the answer to the question that I was asking. Well, one, 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 one could see where, what agreement there is between non-negotiable areas. One could, one could, for example, hypothesize that one non-negotiable area that would be very widely shared would be the area covered by international human rights. Not at all. One could. Not at all. I said go to one China, could. That's exactly hey, the thing they I said against. one could hypothesize that. But one could that's explore the big one that doesn't one, work anymore. One could explore what happened when, uh, if you have countries or societies which do not accept, which, for which that, that that is not a negotiable issue. Sure, China. It's right there. Well, I know, I know. And I we know. don't accept their right to development. They argue, and they, they've got a very coherent. Well, argument. that's an example. That's an example of. Um, the district which I, of a state which I described just now. But uh, yes, I take your point that we all have some non-negotiable areas. That, no. Okay, so one has to put them on the table and one can look, one can describe the non-negotiable areas. Sure, and live with them. Well, it, then one can see whether some non-negotiable some non areas might become a bit less non-negotiable over time. Okay. And if you don't negotiate over time, what happens? We need long-term historical research. Do you what happens to those groups that did agree to compromise their non-negotiable bits, so what happens to the groups that didn't? We've got urgent problems, Andrew. You're not going to sit around for 10 you years. You don't solve <laughs> an urgent problem of this nature in 10 years. This is a 500-year project. You okay, 500 years, you want 500. You want to apply for a bigger grant, Andrew. <laughs> yes, <laughs> absolutely. My research agenda for intercultural studies, because that's what I want to call it, for the next 10 years is we will discover nothing of importance. You'll surely get money for that. Yeah, sure. <laughs> but the neighbouring disciplines and technologies will discover lots of things that we'll have to come to terms with. And the first is uh, neuroscience, neurolinguistics will learn how the brain processes language. And I don't know what we're going to do with that, but, but that's where knowledge is going to come from. Maybe. And the Question second mark. thing is... Not very soon. Perhaps too optimistic. Mark. Ten years a bit well, optimistic. Well, ten optimistic. Twenty, 20 years, years, but okay. You've got to look where we've come from in ten years yes. in that okay. area. And the second is um, machine translation, automatic language processing and machine translation. I think it, we're moving towards a very quickly an environment where everybody can translate using free online software. Translation is going to become fundamentally the fifth basic language skill. Uh, it won't be a concern of the profession. And I'm wondering what that means for if you can do it all the relations online, between it's not cultures. going to be a language skill. It's not nothing in your head. It's something that the computer will do. Technical skill. Uh, what yeah. that's going to mean for relations between cultures, I think, is an interesting question. And, and, that, and there, I think, we're condemned to picking up the pieces to the changes being brought about by technology which is where the real research is 
this happening? Not a bit pessimistic, really. We simply... Oh, no, I look forward to the day when everybody translates. Yeah, but it's pessimistic to think that we're simply running after the technology. I don't see any... I see such a fragmented dis discipline or interdiscipline or non-discipline. I see such a plethora of, of different concerns within cultural studies. I can't imagine a unified research agenda coming out of it. Except in no, there your is no, no, there is no unified agenda anywhere. But there is a, some agenda. And for a certain number of years, in certain disciplines, they all concentrate on one topic, then they go to, yeah. to other But not us. We follow some fashions, you know, I, cu cultural Yes, term, but this need not be term. like that, you know. In many areas of the social sciences and the humanities, there has been some rationality, as you call it, in uh, one question leading to the next, and the next question leading to the next. Okay. Over the years, yeah, I mathematics can, I, to no, find the problem to be solved. Not I mathematics, yeah. things that are closer to us. In linguistics, there have been ups and downs, but on the whole, from um, Saussure onwards, you have a kind of a chain of questions. Sometimes you've got deviations and all sorts of uh, mishaps, but uh, there is some sort of, I don't wish to call it progress, but uh, it's a kind of, um, of development in the sense that uh, it does not repeat itself. You see, if, if the only thing you do is repeating questions and answers that have been given before, then you would call it stagnation. Do you all agree that translation is necessarily an intercultural activity? Necessarily. All translations are intercultural. Well, oh, hold on. Elaborate. <laughs> it depends what you mean by culture. That's the trouble. Because you can translate Chaucer, Middle English, about 600 years ago, into modern English. And we call it translation, but it's still within English culture. So in order to answer the question, you have to, we have to know what is, what no, is, what is meant by culture. Better, there's a smarter answer. Well, I know yeah. that. <laughs> yeah, well, you have Jakobson's paper when he simply distinguishes between interlingual and intralingual translation, and uh, surely even intralingual translation is translation. So uh, yes, agreed. Yes. So uh, from that point of view, the answer would be no. Okay. No, the answer would be yes. No, no, translation would be yes. Intercultural. Yes. Depending on, on your definition of culture then, right? No. All Still translations are intercultural because, as you mentioned, the culture of my family is maybe different to the culture of your family and then... No, my example we, was of example we need, translation we need within translation. the same culture. The yes, more elegant there is never, to be, never the same culture is... Well then, if, if a culture is defined in terms of the family level, no, not on the family level, but there are ingredients that are different. Yeah, so it depends on what you buy culture. But Anthony has the answer. The correct <laughs> answer is this. It's, it's nobody knows what the, how to define the limits of a culture. My proposal was, and has been, uh, that wherever there is a translation, there is a border between cultures. That translations, the existence of translation, yes. defines the culture. Yes, yes, it's a neat point. That's the elegant Yes, yes, I, I take that. Excellent, point. Excellent. Excellent. So then, uh, in your example, uh, we, we could assume that the English culture uh, it's so in far Shakespeare's away. time it was different yeah. from... Well, Chaucer's time. We, we can read Shakespeare, most yeah. people, but I mean, Chaucer is really quite hard. Uh -huh. I mean, it's... Uh, so, uh, it's different from the culture, so the English culture nowadays, so it would be an intercultural operation yes. because of that, right? I no. think I think Anthony's point, which he's made in several places, it, it's, it's a good point. Yes, I take it. It's a, it, it's a sign of it's a sign that there is a gap that has um, that's been created. You mm -hmm. know, cultural gaps being created, which is what you were saying sure. earlier. Sure. You, you, the, this is the point about translation as a sign of difference rather than a sign of bridge crossing. If there's no translation, if I start. Um, Yes, I mean, if I speak the local language, I don't need a translator. So I, I kind of merge more easily with the local culture. But if, as soon as I need a translator, I get my dictionary out. So I'm more conscious of the fact that there's a gap between me and them. 
So then, j just a complement to, to this question, for example, uh, in bilingual environments, for example, here in Catalonia, if we have like a, a web page, let's say a government web page in Spanish, and then it's translated into Catalan or vice versa, mm -hmm. uh, can we assume that uh, Catalan speakers, well, uh, well, it's a it's usually, a political decision. right, both people share the same culture and share the same language. Well, again, you so can't, how no, can you not, a gap exists. is being created? They translate a political the gap is being created. Carlos, it's not completely so. There is already a generation in Catalonia who feels much more at ease with Catalan and who are not so familiar with Castilian. You see, so for them, reading a web page is not just for political purposes, but simply more convenient. Right, but the process of translation, I mean, in the, in the head of the translator, what, what are they doing? Are they translating to another culture or are they translating language? In a way they is it like to a another culture, because if you, if you check, if you compare the websites, even the websites, you won't see the same formulation. Okay. You see different formulations. And I've been comparing uh, commercial texts. I mean, when you buy commercial goods and you have texts in seven languages, and you compare them, I can show you there is no, never, never do you get the same kind of information even about how to use a machine. Uh, French form formulates it differently to English and even if there is a Catalan text, the Catalan text will be different from the Spanish text. Not major differences like English and French, but tiny differences that perhaps do count, do count. It's a different sort of culture because it gives you other options for organizing your life or your view of the world or your habits, I don't know. Why would, why would your question, Carlos, be an interesting question? Yeah, I was wondering whether some translation operations cannot be purely linguistic, for example. Mm -hmm. I mean, oh, and this difference is embedded in the language. I mean, you could take like the cultural element out of it. Yeah. So, why, why, why would that be an important question? Because the, the, the question is so bound up with the way in which one interprets a culture. Oh, I, I actually, because I think there was the assumption in the discussion that translation always involves uh, something intercultural. I mean, no, talking I, about intercultural and translation is kind of... That's not quite the same as the way I put it. I, I have this big framework of, of intercultural something okay, mm -hmm. up there, and I think translation is a part of that. But that, it seems to me that, that you don't have to infer from that that everything in translation is, is, is colored by culture. There's loads of technical linguistic stuff in translation, sure. which I would not really... What would be the point of saying that it's cultural? What would be the point of saying um, that um, in Chaucer, if Chaucer says the, T-H-E-E, -E, he means you in yes. modern English? Yes. Uh, what, what, what new information would it give anybody to say what we have here is a cultural difference? It, it seems really? to be really? insignificant. It seems to be trivial to, no. say, to want to say that. Why trivial? Because in Chaucer's time there is still a distinction between the yes, honorary, yes, 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 the yes, honorary okay, and the honorary. Okay, but I mean, I don't think that that's, I don't know whether that, how significant that would be, how interesting that would be. I don't well, know what the point I, I had a professor, Andrew, who argued quite seriously that French culture was more sexist than English culture because their nouns have two genders. <laughs> so what about Finnish culture? So there's no, many, gen there's no gender at all. We have so so plenty, but we have so many other languages. So many other languages. But you have to accept that, that linguistic there can be linguistic operations that have no cultural consequences.